This says there was a husband and wife, and they are Christmas shopping at a busy shopping mall just before Christmas. The wife suddenly noticed that her husband was missing. And as they had a lot to do, she called him on his cell. The wife said, where are you? We have lots to do. He said, you remember the jewelers we went into about 10 years ago? You remember that jewelry store? And you fell in love with that diamond necklace. I could not afford it at the time. And I said one day, I'm going to get it for you. Tears started to flow down her cheek. And she got all choked up. Yes, I do remember that shop, she said. He said, well, I'm in the gun shop next door. <laughs> well, folks, in all of the Christmas, let's don't miss the Christ. Amen? Let's don't miss the Christ in all the Christmas. We've been uh, preaching about Christmas classics. I talked about how the Grinch who stole Christmas. I talked about uh, last week, It's a Wonderful Life. And I want to continue that this week. We're going to take our copy of God's Word and we're going to stand. Can we do that? We're going to stand. We're going to take our copy of God's Word. And we're going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I want to call your attention to some of my favorite scriptures. 2 Timothy 4 verse 13. And this is just a personal letter from Paul to his son Timothy and his son in the Lord. And this is what he said to Timothy. He said, Timothy, the coat, the jacket that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. Bring my books. Bring my parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. At my first hearing, no men stood with me, but all men forsook me. He said, I, I pray, God, that it, it's not laid to their charge. But he said, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. And by me, the preaching might be fully known that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Let us pray. Jesus, I pray today that you would speak to us and through us. Holy Spirit, I believe in you. <laughs> I, I believe in you, Holy Spirit. I believe in you so much that I know unless you come and anoint us, I what I'd say is really not going to amount to much. So Jesus, would you just come and anoint us today in a special way? God, these are wonderful, precious people. And I pray that I can give a word from your word that will be a help to them. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk to you about home alone. Home Alone. It's a cute little movie, Home Alone. It's about the McAllister family. The McAllister family, the entire group, have decided that they're going to go to Paris for Christmas. One of the members of the family is a young man. His name is uh, Kevin. He's eight years old. Kevin McAllister. Macaulay Culkin. And Kevin says, after spending some time with his family, he literally says, I just wish all my family would disappear. I'm so frustrated with all these family members. Macaulay Culkin says, Kevin says, I just wish they would disappear. And if you've ever watched the movie, there's about 20 people that are in Chicago and they're getting ready early one morning to head out to Paris. And what they actually do is they forget this young eight-year-old eight -year boy. And he's left home alone by himself. And he spends a few days without his family. 
But he does have a little company. He has two burglars. Two burglars known as the wet bandits. And he, co he convinces those wet bandits that his family's still there. But uh, they're not there. But after just a little while, Kevin starts saying, you know, I, I really miss my family. I wish my family was here. And he actually goes to a Santa Claus. And by the way, it's not the real Santa Claus. He goes to a Santa Claus and he says to that Santa Claus, I know you're not the real Santa Claus, but I want you to tell the real Santa Claus what I want for Christmas this year is I want all of my family to come home because I'm tired of being home alone. Not only does he go to Santa Claus, but he looks at a picture of his family. He looks at a picture of his family and he realizes how much he, he misses his family. And he says, I just wish my family was back home. And then he goes to this house and he looks at this house and he sees this happy family and he sees they're celebrating Christmas. And Kevin says, I just wish I had my family. Now here's what's interesting, folks. For starters... <laughs> He said, I just wish my family would disappear. But now he says, I really want them back. Because I don't want to be home alone. You know, I was researching. And I found out four out of every ten people battle loneliness. I found out four out of every ten people battle loneliness. I found out that 50% of the time, when people have heart attacks, it's because they're feeling lonely. I found out that literally loneliness can be as harmful on the body as 15 cigarettes a day. Home alone. Albert Einstein said, it is strange to be known universally it's strange to be known universally and yet be so lonely. It's strange to be known universally and yet be so lonely. Marilyn Monroe said, the only people who stay with me, I have to pay. I am so lonely. The only people that stay with me, I have to pay. I am so lonely. Loneliness is very difficult, especially this time of year. Now, I want us to look at some things, folks, quickly. The first thing I want us to look at is the loneliness of the Savior. The loneliness of the Savior. I want you to understand something, folks. You said, Pastor Benny, this message is certainly for me. Well, I want to say something. If there's anybody who understands what you're going through, it's Jesus. If there's anybody who understands what you're going through, it's Jesus. Think about Jesus comes to his own people. He came to the Jewish people. By the way, he was not a Mexican. He was a Jew. He came to his own people. And John 1, 11 and 12 says, he came unto his own. And his own received him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. His people did not receive him. Can I tell you something, folks? Jesus had four brothers, and he had at least two sisters. You say, four brothers, Pastor Benny, and he had at least two sisters? Yes, he sure did. But you know, John 7 and 5 says, neither did his brethren believe in him. I'm talking about four brothers. They were raised in the house with him. I'm talking about the, at least two sisters that were raised in the house with him. But, but they didn't believe in him. Now, see, folks, we, we give Peter a bad rap. <laughs> we give Peter a bad rap, and we say, oh, Peter, Peter denied the Lord. But we really need to read the Scripture real closely. Because if we read it real closely in Matthew 26, 56, the Bible says this, that all the disciples forsook him and fled. It wasn't just Peter. The Bible says every one of the disciples forsook him and fled. 
If there's anybody that understands loneliness, it's Jesus. Think about it. When Jesus was even on the cross, ladies and gentlemen, even on the cross, the moment he became my sin and your sin, you know what God did? God turned his back on his son. God turned his back on his son because the Bible says that God's of pure eyes in Malachi than to look upon sin. And the moment that Jesus became our sin, God turned his back on his very own son and he wouldn't look at him. And at that moment, Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God turned his back on his son the moment he became the propitiation, the moment he became the atonement for our sin. Jesus knows, folks. Isaiah 53 and 4 says, Surely he had bore our griefs. He's carried our sorrows. Jesus knows what it is to be lonely because he was human. Did you ever think about this, folks? He was on that Emmaus road. He was on that Emmaus road in Luke 24 and 28. This, this scripture is always profound. I mean, it's, it's just amazed me. He's on the Emmaus road. He's resurrected. He's, he, I mean, he's, he's, he's glorified. Look what the Bible says. And they drew nigh to the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. What happens? Jesus is walking with some guys, and he, he jumps up, acting like he's going to go further because he wants them to call him back, the Bible says. Come back and be with us, Jesus. Come back and be with us. He wanted their company. I want you to understand the loneliness of the Savior. Jesus understands. You say, Pastor, I'm lonely this Christmas. Nobody understands. I want you to know something. Jesus understands. I want you to know something. Jesus understands what you're going through this Christmas. Not only do I see the loneliness of the Savior, but I see the loneliness of solitude. The loneliness of solitude. Just a week or so ago, I was in a correctional institution. I had the wonderful opportunity of preaching there. And it was on a Saturday. And I was going to preach there. And there was families coming through, coming through security as I was coming through security. And I saw the warden and I said, what's going on today? He said, well, today's visitation. Today's visitation for the, for the inmates. I said, I want to ask you something. Do they all get visitation? Do they all get visitation? He said, Pastor, I wish they did. But he said, no. To be honest with you, most of them don't. Most of them go years, Pastor, and nobody sees them. One out of every four people in America last night ate dinner alone. I thought about that military family that separated. He's, he's serving on the foreign field and maybe his wife is here or maybe vice versa. But the loneliness that creeps in. I thought about the, the executive that travels all the time and he's in a hotel room and the walls start closing in. I thought about that housewife that's home day in, day out. No adult conversation and how loneliness creeps in. The greatest thing that pastors battle, the greatest thing that pastors battle, I can assure you, is loneliness. Loneliness. The loneliness of solitude. Why don't you see something else? The loneliness of self. The loneliness of self. See, I believe when we're lonely, it affects us. I believe when we're lonely, it shows up. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Well, I believe it shows up in our morals. It shows up in our morals. I believe many people turn to drugs. They turn to alcohol. They turn to improper relationships just because they're lonely. I think it shows up in our dress. When you see someone and you say, Pastor Benny, they're, they're dressed provocative. They're dressed, they're certainly immodest. What a... What a confident person no 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 I don't see confidence I see an insecure person that's so lonely and trying to draw attention to themselves I see it in our finances we go out and we buy things we buy this and we buy this and we shop here and we shop there the root of the problem we're just lonely 
I see it in our self-image. People say, well, I don't, I, I don't have anybody. I don't have anybody. I must be a bad person because I don't have anybody. I see it in our health. 80% of counseling, counselors say 80% of the people that they counsel say they have feelings of loneliness. Lonely people are more likely to suffer from dementia, heart disease, and depression. If you're lonely, your increase of death, the, your death increases by 29%. The loneliness of self, but let me move number four, the loneliness of suffering. The loneliness of suffering. You know, in John chapter 5, verse 5 through 7, the Bible says, and there was a certain man He had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. And when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Will you be made whole? And the impotent man answered, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in the pool. While I'm coming, another step steppeth down before me. 38 years. Very sick. But I have nobody to help me. People are lonely because they're suffering, because they're sick, because they have physical problems. They feel like I just have nobody to help me. The loneliness of separation. In John chapter 11, we read about Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha are weeping. They're weeping because they had lost their brother. There was a separation. Their brother had died. This year, people are lonely because of separation, because of death, because of a divorce. But I want to say something to you. Even this year, if you've experienced death, you've experienced a divorce, and many, many, many people have. I want you to know God still has a plan for you. God still has a plan. God still has a purpose. My heart may twist and turn. My heart may throb and ache. But it's in my soul. I'm glad I know that our God makes no mistake. And it was a surprise to you, but it's not a surprise to God. And I want you to know there's life after it. I want you to know there's life after it. Don't you ever believe the lie of the devil because you've been through a divorce, you're through. Don't you ever believe that, folks. Don't you ever believe that. God's still got a plan. God's still got a purpose for your life. Divorce is not an unpardonable sin. And sometimes you do the best you can do and divorce still happens. Sometimes you can't control somebody else's actions. Somebody else's actions. Let me give you number six. The loneliness of sin. The loneliness of sin. And I'm trying to move, but folks, John chapter 13, verse 30 says that Judas betrayed the Lord and he went out and it was not. He went out and it was not. Let me tell you, the loneliest person on earth is that person that at one time knew the Lord and you're not living for the Lord now and you're not serving the Lord now and you go out and it's not. You go out and it's dark. You go out and you're unhappy. You go out and you're miserable. Because let me tell you something, folks. If you've known God, sin is so lonely. Sin is so lonely. It may appease for a little while, but I want you to know there's no loneliness like sin. Sin is so lonely. But I want to say something, folks. I've got good news. You can come back. (laughs) And you'll find him right where you left him. (laughs) And you'll find him right where you left him. And folks, the good news. See, 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins... He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, you said, Pastor, give me 
Give me some handles. Give me, give, me, give, give me some handles for handling loneliness. I'm, maybe you're home alone. Give me some handles for handling loneliness. Let me, let me give you four or five things, and I, I think these will be, be very beneficial. They're all from the life of Paul. Now, you said, Pastor, what, what does this guy know about loneliness? Well, when he wrote this, he was in the Mamertine prison. I mean, literally what they would do, they would take ropes they would put them on their hands and they would drop them down into a black hole. And they were in a black hole. It was dark. It was damp. It was a dungeon. This is not an exaggeration. I researched it. Many times men that were dropped down into this dungeon were literally eaten by rats. Not an exaggeration. Were literally eaten by rats while they were in the Mamertine prison. Now, that's where he was. All by himself, periodically, they dropped some food down. Here he was, waiting for his head to be chopped off at Nero's chop block. So he knows something about loneliness. And he tells us how to handle loneliness even today. How, to, how can I handle loneliness, Pastor? Let me give you some steps. Number one, he utilized his time. <laughs> he utilized his time. In verse 13, you notice what he said? Bring my books. Bring, bring the parchments. What did he do? Well, folks, while he was in this dungeon, he was writing the New Testament. <laughs> while he was in this prison, folks, he was literally writing the New Testament. And what I would say to you is utilize your time. I remember years ago I met with Franklin Graham and I said, Franklin, I, I hate your, your, your dad, the son of the great Billy Graham. I said, I hate your dad's ministry's over. He said, Preacher Benny, my dad's preaching ministry's over. His praying ministry's not over. Dad spends hours, Pastor Benny. He spends hours praying. He spends hours. He's got a prayer list. He goes over it every day. He's constantly praying for people. I'm saying today, you say, Pastor Benny, I'm very lonely. What would you recommend? Utilize your time. You know, there's a reason why 85% of pink ladies don't have emotional problems. They've learned to utilize their time. See, uh, there's two ways to get to the top of an oak tree. Number one just start climbing. Just start climbing. Number two is set on an acorn and wait. I recommend you start climbing. See, we miss it, folks. You say, Pastor Benny, I've been through a tough time. I've been through a tough time. And time heals all hurts. When somebody tells you that, that's not true. You said, Pastor Benny said that wasn't true. No, no. Time doesn't heal all hurts. What you do with time heals all hurts. Time doesn't heal all hurts. What you do with the time heals all hurts. And I'll tell you the first thing this guy did. He said, I'm lonely, but he utilized his time. I'll tell you the second thing he did. He minimized his hurts. He minimized his hurts. If you look at verse 16, he said, uh, at my first hearing, no man stood with me, but all forsook me. But he said, wait, God, they, they forsook me. They left me just when I needed them most. But God, don't lay it to their charge. What was he doing, folks? He was minimizing his hurts. You know, if you've ever watched Home Alone, Kevin meets Mr. Marley. Mr. Marley, they said, was a serial killer. And they had formed the opinion that Mr. Marley was a bad guy. He was a serial killer, but he really was a good guy. I wonder how many times we do that. And Mr. Marley's in church with Kevin. And Mr. Marley says, you know why I'm here? He says, no. He says, my granddaughter, that beautiful redhead up there, that's my granddaughter. And I don't get to spend time with her. I don't get to spend time with her. Because her father and I are estranged. Her father and I are estranged. And I, I don't get to be with her. And I don't get to be with my son. 
And Kevin, eight years old, said, I tell you what, Mr. Marley, I sure wouldn't let that happen. I sure would reach out to my son. I sure wouldn't want to be estranged from my dad. I'd do whatever to try to reconcile with my son. And if you watch the movie all the way through, at the end of the movie, Mr. Marley reconciles with his family. I want to say something to you folks. I want want to just say this from the bottom of my heart. (laughs) Try that. Try that. Try to reconcile. God don't lay that to their charge. Try to get past it. For the sake of your family, try to get past it. What did he do? He, he, he minim, minimized his hurts. Now, you say, par, paraphrase that. Bitch. <laughs> paraphrase that. Really make it practical. This is what he said in modern day vernacular. I'm not the first one to go through a divorce. I'm not the first one to lose my job. I'm not the first one to file bankruptcy. I'm not the first one to bury a family member. What did he do? He didn't maximize it. He minimized it. I'm saying, folks, it doesn't help you to maximize it. Psalms 23 and 4, look at this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Somebody said, Pastor, I've been through something. When do you think I'm going to get over it? Probably never. Probably never. You don't get over, you get through. And you pray and say, God, help me to get through. I want to be a, I don't want to be different because I I, want to learn from it. But God, help me to just get through. Let me tell you the third thing. He maximized his Bible reading and prayer time. (laughs) He maximized his Bible reading and prayer time. He said, no, no, bring me my books. Bring me my parchment. Let, let, me, let me say something to this, folks. You say, Pastor, and I'm, this is all I'm going to say on this point, but this may be the most important thing I say in the message. Your motivation for reading your Bible and your prayer time can't be needs. You say, oh, well, yeah, Pastor Benny, I pray about needs. No, 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 no. That can't be your motivation because listen to me very closely. When you don't have a lot of needs, you'll find you're not praying. See, if your total motivation is just, I'm praying about needs, when you don't have a lot of needs, you won't be praying. Your motivation has got to be your fellowship with God. Your motivation has got to be, I want to hear from God. I want to hear from God. I want want to talk with God. I want to spend time with God. I want to be to the point that I miss it when I don't have it. That's got to be your motivation. Number four, he realized he needed a friend. He realized he needed a friend. If you look at 2 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 11, look what he said. He said, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to this ministry. You know what's amazing? I don't have time to elaborate. But he and Mark had got sideways. He'd got sideways. Oh, folks, listen, two people can't be right with God and wrong with each other. No, no, you you can't. He said, I want old Mark to come back. You said, Pastor Benny, I'm lonely. What do you recommend? Pray that God will send you a good godly friend. Pray that God will send you a good godly friend. And let me make this statement. Church is a great place to find one. Amen? Pray that God will send you a good godly friend and church is a great place to find one. And lastly, he recognized God's presence was always with him. (laughs) He recognized that God's presence was always with him. Look what verse 17 says. Notwithstanding, The Lord stood with me, and he strengthened me. Hebrews 13 and 5, Jesus said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now, right here's a tweet. (laughs) 
Christians can be lonely, but Christians can never be alone. (laughs) Christians can be lonely, but Christians can never be alone. Because no matter what you're going through, God's going to be with you. I found him blooming where heartaches abundantly reign. Who would have dreamed so much joy and so much pain? It's good on the mountains, but the mountains, they come and they go. But down in the valley, there's always a rose. You know what I believe, folks? I believe the worst thing I believe the worst thing about a person dying without Christ. I believe the worst thing is the eternal separation from God. Because we were created to know Him. That's why in our lives, you miss him. If you don't know him, you say, Pastor Benny, how can I, how can I miss him when he's never been there? Because you were created for him to be there. Because Ecclesiastes 3 and 11 says, he's put eternity in your heart. So you, we try everything else. Trying to feel the loneliness. But only he can feel that loneliness. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. Only he can feel that loneliness. 